Welcome to A Popular History of Unpopular Things, a mostly scripted podcast that makes history more fun and accessible. My kind of history is the unpopular stuff. Disease, death, and destruction. I like learning about all things bloody, gross, mysterious, and weird. Just a quick reminder that you can support me and the show on Patreon. Just look up either A Popular History of Unpopular Things or AFOUT, that's A-P-H-O-U-T, and you can also now watch episodes on YouTube, so go subscribe to my YouTube channel there. Links to both the Patreon and YouTube are in the description. So back in late 2022, I did an episode on the lost Roanoke colony, the first attempt at a permanent English settlement, but it failed miserably. (laughs) And in doing that episode, I made a mental note to one day do an episode on the Jamestown colony, the first permanent English settlement in North America. And here we are, 31 episodes later, if you can believe it, Revisiting Early American History. There is a lot of information about Jamestown, and I'm not going over every minute detail that surrounds the topic. I just can't. I can't fit that in a 45-minute, 50-minute podcast, right? There's no possible way to accurately capture the social tension between men of different classes, all of the economic factors at play, the intense political rivalry and and factions between different indigenous groups, and how the English arrival changed that balance. Instead, I'm going to give a narrative on the overall history and, of course, the gross stuff, or, you know, things I otherwise find interesting. I will also do my best to string it all together into a compelling and historically accurate narrative. For any new listeners out there, that's what I always try to do with my episodes. Just because Jamestown is the first permanent, or some would say successful, settlement, that doesn't mean it doesn't have its share of misery, struggles, blood, guts, horrifying executions. No, seriously, I've got one example that will probably make you cringe. It made me cringe a little bit, so that's telling you something. Disease, and of course, also because it's F out, cannibalism. So today, we're going to dive into the Jamestown colony in all of its gruesome glory to get an idea of how hard it was for English settlers coming to North America. Forget the sugar-coated stuff from elementary school about settlers and Native Americans always getting along. Forget basically the entirety of the film Pocahontas. All right, just leave that one at, leave that one at the door. Benjamin Woolley puts it well in his book, entitled Savage Kingdom, The True Story of Jamestown 1607 and the Settlement of America. Quote, The story of England's attempt to colonize America is about flawed, dispossessed, desperate people trying to reinvent themselves. It is about being caught in a dirty struggle to survive, haunted by failure, hungering for escape, dreaming of riches, and hoping for redemption. End quote. So as always, we'll start with some historical context to get a good idea of why settlers were heading to North America, and then we'll break down how difficult it was to survive in a harsh new world. Let's get started. There's a lot to talk about today, so I'm going to keep my historical context somewhat brief for me, (laughs) anyway, as brief as I can. I'm also going to take a step back and look at it from a big picture perspective. Essentially, what was going in the world that leads to the English trying to found settlements in North America? And to answer that, I want to go back to the fall of Constantinople, 1453. Constantinople was an Orthodox Christian city, the last big city that survived from the Roman Empire. Some actually consider the fall of Constantinople to be the actual fall of Rome, if you consider the Byzantine Empire as the eastern half of the Roman Empire and not a separate entity after Rome fell. It depends on which historian you ask, to be honest. Otherwise, the traditional answer for the fall of Rome is 476 CE. But anyway, in 1453, Constantinople fell to Mehmed II, also known as Mehmed the Conqueror. He besieged the city for 55 days straight, constant cannon fire, until that cannon fire barrage broke through the walls of Constantinople. He and his men fled the city and it fell. 
In its place, he established Istanbul, an Islamic city which still exists today in modern-day Turkey. The reason that this is part of our story today is because it put a lot of pressure on Europe. Constantinople was not just an Eastern Christian city, but also a huge trading point on the Silk Road's trade network that spanned east to west and connected Africa and Europe to Asia. When Europe lost that big Christian trade city, they felt both religiously and economically threatened. It's part of the reason the Portuguese, then the Spanish, and later the French, English, and Dutch started exploring alternative routes to Asia by sea, of course. The Portuguese were the first Europeans to sail around the southern tip of Africa and start trading in the Indian Ocean. And the Spanish later set off in the other direction, out west, across the Atlantic, looking for a route to Asia. Cue Christopher Columbus and my whole rant on Christopher Columbus and how much I don't like him, right? So the fall of Constantinople is one of those big turning points that led to the European Age of Exploration, which eventually gets the English to land on the shores of North America. But not only did Catholic Europeans feel threatened by growing power and the might of Islam, which was encroaching more and more into Eastern Europe, it got as far north as Vienna in Austria, modern day Austria, but they also felt threatened by the Protestant Reformation, a split in the Catholic Church. Now, alongside Catholicism, there was Protest Protestantism and then also other Christian denominations. Literacy rates were improving. People were reading the Bible for the first time in some cases and making up their own interpretations on how to get into heaven, eternal salvation, right? But also how to lead good, moral Christian lives. Many Christians in England were unhappy with how religion was going down, and some sought new lands to practice their religion in peace. Jamestown wasn't really about that. The northern settlements that came later, like Salem or the Massachusetts Bay Colony, those are where the Puritans, we call them, went, the Puritans, right? And they ended up being those religious havens. Other New World settlers migrated because they were unhappy with England's very rigid social class system, punishments, and restrictions. But regardless, there was a push to spread Christianity to these new lands to civilize, in very heavy air quotes, the indigenous peoples who lived there. Was it about saving those they deemed to be heathens? Or was it more about spreading Christianity to try to outpace Islam and also Catholicism? Both, I guess. It depends on who you ask and what settlement you're talking about. But as if that wasn't enough reason, we also have to factor in the Spanish. Spain had laid claim to pretty much all lands in the Western Hemisphere, what we call the New World. They signed a treaty with the Portuguese called the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494 to help decide who would control newly discovered lands in North and South America. Spain, well, not just those, really, all around the world, but the Spanish were the ones who claimed everything that ended up being North and South America. Spain, a Catholic country, was a huge English rival. In fact, if you listen to my Roanoke episode, it was number seven, or already just happened to know enough about it, part of the reason that those earliest colonization efforts happened was to harass the Spanish and try to damage Spanish economic power in the Americas. And the English war against Spain in the late 16th century prevented more supply ships from going to Roanoke to help su uh, support that first colony. Well, Jamestown wasn't too much longer after Roanoke failed, at least not in the scheme of things. There was still a desire to A, outpace the Spanish, B, take some lands away from the Spanish, and C, profit off of New World riches that the Spanish were already profiting off of. By this point in time, Spain was making a ton of money off gold and silver mines in the Mexican Sierra Madres Mountains and the South America Andes Mountains. And England wanted to compete with them, so they were interested in finding value in North American lands. They also wanted to find a Northwest Passage to the Pacific and thought maybe all of those massive river systems they spotted in and around the Chesapeake Bay area could hold key to that route. So 
after that particular conflict with Spain ended in 1604, there were some who wanted to try settling in North America again for all the aforementioned reasons. And that's why in 1607, three ships, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery crossed the Atlantic to find a perfect place for settling somewhere up in the Chesapeake Bay region in Virginia. Though all three ships did make the trip without too many major issues, they did get stuck waiting for weather in the English Channel, making the voyage five months instead of what they estimated would be only two months. And since the men were stuck on board for longer than anticipated, they had to dip into their supplies, which were meant for survival on the first few months at Jamestown. Because they're not arriving to a place that already has a thriving agricultural system. They had to do that themselves, and that takes time. So they brought supplies to survive, but they had to start eating those early because they were stuck on board for three months longer than anticipated. This will, of course, come into play later when the settlers are starving and don't have those extra supplies. By the time they found the land they were looking for, it was May 1607. They specifically chose this part of North America, Virginia, for a few reasons. First, the water in and around the Chesapeake Bay, at least close to the mouth of the different rivers, was deeper than the waters around England's previous attempt at settlement at Roanoke. That's kind of like in the Outer Banks area of North Carolina. One of the big problems with Roanoke was that the waters around it were so shallow that ships couldn't navigate the waters easily without beaching themselves or getting wrecked, or just get right up to the settlement anyway for offloading shipments and supplies and people and things, which is good for preventing a Spanish invasion, I guess, but it is not good for the English ships who wanted to bring new supplies. Second, they felt that Virginia was far enough away from Spanish settlements in Florida, but they didn't want more war with Spanish with the Spanish, so they, they figured it was far enough away to prevent that. And third, some of the Roanoke settlers had actually explored parts of the Chesapeake, and they had noted that the indigenous groups there were generally open to trade and had access to things like copper mines, maybe even gold mines, far inland. So three pretty good reasons for choosing the lands that they called Virginia, named after Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen. They sailed west into a river called the James River, named after their current monarch, King James I, and settled Jamestown on a real swampy little peninsula up the James River. So, you would think they would land, right? The first thing you need to do is establish yourself. Did they build a strong, fortified settlement right away? Actually, no. They were initially told during planning, you know, before the trip even started, that, quote, you must have great care not to offend the natives if you can avoid it and employ some of your company to trade with them for corn and all other lasting victuals, end quote. That reads because they chose this area with the hopes of trading with the locals. They were told to trade with the locals. They brought fewer supplies with them because they assumed they could get hope, uh, help from the locals. So therefore, they did their best to not offend them, which means they didn't initially build big walls. That just kind of assumes that you think they're going to attack you and they didn't want to make, they didn't, at least they didn't want the, the natives to think that they were making that assumption. That would be kind of a bad look. And right away, this decision caused dissension between the men. To be fair, there was evidence of political factions forming while still on board the ships on the way over, but I want to focus on this part once we get to Jamestown. The leader at this point, just the, the basic of it, the leader at this point did not want to offend the, the locals. The most outspoken critic of this decision, though, was a man whose name you might recognize, or at least you should, Captain John Smith. Smith would later engage in behaviors that were less focused on making friends with the indigenous and more focused on making them bend to his will. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. The Jamestown settlers do eventually realize that they need to build defensive structures as some indigenous groups pretty much from day one actually started harassing them and attacking them. On one occasion, some of the Jamestown settlers went on a short expedition to meet and learn from some friendly locals. And while they were gone, a warrior named Opechancano of the Powhatan took it upon himself to eliminate the English so their settlement wouldn't be permanent. It was like 200 of them just kind of came in and started attacking. 
Opechancano was the younger brother of the Powhatan chief, who we just call Powhatan. We call him Powhatan, though his actual name was Wahun Sinakok. I'll continue to call him Powhatan, though, as it's more recognizable to a wider audience. So Opechancano and 200 warriors attacked the not-fortified Jamestown while the settlers were trying to plant corn before the season ended. Remember, they arrived later than they thought they would. Most of their weapons were still packed away, so they only had a handful of pistols and swords with which to defend themselves. One boy was killed, and I do mean boy, there were a handful of small children on board, another dozen or so injured, and they were forced to run away. It wasn't enough to deter the Jamestown settlers, but it did convince their leader to build some walls. Generally speaking, a five-sided pentagon was considered to be the best defensive structure at the time. The longer walls wouldn't be too long, I suppose, so they could be more easily monitored. However, given the shape of the swampy peninsula they inhabited, they went with a triangular shape. There was a longer side, 140 yards, running parallel with the James River, and then the two other sides were 100 yards each. The enclosed space ended up being about an acre of land, and the plan was to have military barracks, the church, a storehouse, an open-air market, and other important residences within the walls, like the leader of the, of the settlement. Outside the enclosed space there would be dwellings, the cornfields, all that kind of stuff. And it's a good thing they got those fortifications up because the attacks did not stop. Men found outside the walls were at risk of being shot with an arrow and potentially killed. That did happen a handful of times. This was a problem because remember, the men of Jamestown assumed that they would be able to trade with local populations for food. And since they risked their life going outside the walls, they also had a hard time planting enough corn in the fields. So we're looking at a situation here where they are quickly running low on supplies and also remember that they arrived with fewer supplies than intended, right? So it's not looking too good. Now, once the fort was set up, or at least the walls built, two of the ships headed back to England under Captain Christopher Newport, who ended up making several trips back and forth. You're going to hear his name a lot. It was especially important to bring more food and supplies, including ammo and guns for protection, seeing as how the settlement was not going according to plan. The third boat was left behind for the settlers to use. A month after arrival, June 1607, Newport returned to England, and he brought with him a sample of soil, too. He hoped that there was copper and gold in it. That was one of the reasons they chose that area in the first place. And that would encourage the English investors that this was, in fact, a good idea, and it was not going to be another Roanoke situation. The settlers who stayed behind at Jamestown were not in a great place. As Benjamin Woolley puts it in his book, quote, their houses were for the most part fragile tents, devoid of home comforts. The weather, Indians, and supplies were erratic, preventing all attempts to find a settled or familiar routine. Worse yet, the counselors in charge of Jamestown, and in whose hands their fate now rested, seemed to be infected with the scheming and plots, petty rules, and brutal, pun brutal punishments they had hoped to leave behind in England. End quote. Newport didn't return until early January 1608, and in that six to seven month period, the Jamestown settlers found themselves in a desperate battle for survival against death and disease. And by the end of 1607, the number of surviving settlers dropped to 38 from 104. So let's take a closer look at what happened to them in the six or so months before Newport returned with help. Almost immediately after Newport and some others left Jamestown, there was a big decline in health. Part of it was the lack of supplies. There wasn't enough food, so people were suffering from malnutrition. But there also wasn't enough clean water to drink, so they took to drinking water just straight out of the James River. They really didn't have much of a choice, but in general, if you have a choice, it is not a good idea to drink straight river water like this. Not only was the water kind of salty because of its proximity to the Atlantic, but the whole area was a swamp. So add in slime and muck and dirt and all kind of nonsense into the mix. It gave them all kinds of diseases, included, including one noted as bloody flux. And if you're not familiar with the term flux in this context, it means diarrhea. Bloody diarrhea. You're welcome. 
The original plan was to plant crops, build the fort, and trade with the Indians they encountered, at least the friendly ones, right? Well, they arrived too late in the planting season, with fewer supplies than anticipated, and they weren't doing so well on the trade front either. Food rations were cut down to only a half pint of wheat and barley boiled in water once a day. All of this, of course, the being super hungry all the time and being afraid of attacks from the Indians, was only making factionalism between different groups and conflict between the settlers worse. So perhaps they could rely on natural resources to survive, right? There should be an abundance of that. Or what was the situation with plants and nuts and berries and animals, hunting, fishing, right? Well, there just weren't enough around to sustain the population there. They also weren't super skilled at doing all of that. And when looking at the established indigenous towns in the area, about one third of their food only came from fishing, hunting, and gathering. It was all about agriculture, which Jamestown was having trouble with. In mid-August alone, several men were dying per day of starvation or disease. So something needed to happen. Enter Captain John Smith a bold and brash settler who decided to travel up later and uh, up river and later the Chesapeake in search of food, whether that be by trading it or taking it. When he did trade for corn, he made sure not to trade too much with any one settlement because he didn't want to make it look like the people at Jamestown were desperate and starving, which they were, because that might actually invade more raids. If we appear weak and they consider us the enemy, that will be their time to strike, right? So it was a pretty smart idea, to be fair. He did get some food, but it wasn't really enough to keep everybody full or not on the brink of starvation. On this expedition, Smith was captured. But before I talk about that, because it will be the introduction of Pocahontas into our story, first, I want to talk about what happened to another man, George Kassan. When Smith and a few others got off the boat to go and treat with some locals, George was left on board to guard it. He was lured off the ship by a few women, and it's not clear what he did, but it's implied by some historians that he was either attacked or he otherwise assaulted the women. He was captured and brought in for interrogation at the hands of Opechancano, who you might remember as the warrior who raided Jamestown earlier on, Powhatan's younger brother. And after a while, George is executed, but in the most brutal way imaginable. Warning, this is super, super gross. Okay? The information comes from the published account of one of the men who was there and witnessed the execution, William White. Here we go. It's not a quote, but just prepare yourselves. So George's captors used muscle shells, the shells of muscles, right? Which, by the way, are really, really sharp to cut through his skin and muscles like a knife, removing his limbs from his body. And each limb was thrown into a fire when it was removed. This process continued until he was just a head and a torso. And then his executioners flipped him over onto his front, or what remained of it at this point, and made a cut around the back of his neck. The sharp muscles were then slid up under the skin and separated the scalp from the skull. And then they flipped him back over onto his back and removed his face. So they used the muscle, they used the muscle shells to separate the skin from all the bits underneath and then removed the skin from his face. Then they would split the abdomen open, remove the stomach and the bowels, and then he was thrown on the fire. Mm, okay then. Now, there are only two recorded instances of this particular form of execution on record in Virginia, but it's also worth noting that many of our sources about the peoples who inhabited Virginia, or what they called Senacomoco, come from the settlers, the English settlers, right? So there could have been many more that we just don't have records about, or alternatively, they might be pretty badly exaggerated to make the Native Americans look bad. Woolley speculates that this form of execution was meant for particular crimes or possibly even just foreigners. They called us Ota Santa Suwak, which means wearer of leg coverings. But anyway, that was gross. The others who witnessed it, including our source reference here, returned to Jamestown freshly scarred from the experience and perhaps, as Opechan Cano might have intended, a little bit more afraid of double-crossing the indigenous around them or just being on their lands in general. Back at camp, these guys who survived this experience, they found disease rampant. 
but they didn't find John Smith. He was still missing. He did not suffer the same fate as George Kassan. Smith was also taken captive by Op- Cano, though, and, and even though everybody around with John Smith on this expedition was killed, he was not. And I think it's because they recognized that John Smith had more power in the community. So, according to John Smith, they offered him life, liberty, land, and women if he gave up information about the weaknesses of Jamestown's defensive structures. So, of course, that Opechan Kano and the Powhatan warriors could attack. On January 2nd, 1609, John Smith wandered back into the Jamestown fort with some Indian escorts. He sends the escorts back with two cannons and a grindstone, and then tells the remarkable story of how he managed to escape. It's probably mostly fictional anyway, but the gist of his story is that he was brought to Powhatan, the leader of the whole area, an emperor of sorts who controlled a bunch of different Native American tribes. Powhatan was apparently about to cut his head off when his 12-year-old daughter, Matawaka, who has the more recognizable nickname of Pocahontas, jumped in, like just jumped in there to save him at the last minute. You know, just don't hurt him, right? After that, Powhatan decided to keep John Smith on to help build things for him, like ammo and weapons, but he was then apparently released two days later, so long as he sent back cannons and the grindstone. Like I said, likely very exaggerated, but regardless, relations between the Jamestown settlers and Powhatan were improving at this point. Pocahontas was sent as an envoy every four or five days to bring fresh supplies to the Jamestown settlers, and also presumably so Powhatan could keep an eye on what they were doing. And also, for those of you who have seen the Disney animation, Pocahontas did not have any kind of relationship with John Smith whatsoever. She was 12 years old at the time that this happened. She did end up marrying an English settler, but his name was John Rolfe. We'll get to him later. The man in charge of Jamestown, who at this point, it had changed a few times, but right now his name is John Ratcliffe, he'll pop up again later, blames John Smith for the deaths of all the other men. After all, it was his expedition and brash actions that got the men killed. He was also a vocal opponent and challenger to the other men running Jamestown, so Smith was seen as a political threat. Smith was sentenced to hang for his crimes, but on the day that he was supposed to die, with the world's best timing, Captain Newport returns, like literally the same day. Perfect, right? His arrival spared John Smith's life, and helpfully, he also brought with him a hundred more settlers, some food, some supplies. Awesome. It's worth noting though, that Newport only really came back because he argued that there was still value to the land here. At first, when he arrived back in England, Newport had no intention of returning to Virginia because the sample of dirt that he brought back with him had no important minerals and metals in it of any kind. So this tells us, as historians, that the settlement and the men were not the most important part of this venture. It was the perceived value of the land. They would be willing to leave the men and the settlement to die off if the land wasn't valuable enough to warrant a return trip. And this was also made clear by the professions of some of these new settlers that Newport brought back with him, including, but not limited to, tailors looking for new materials for garments, apothecaries looking for new medicinal ingredients, goldsmiths, and ore refiners. Newport was determined to find value here, namely, and most importantly, the copper and gold that they had heard existed somewhere in land. Now that Newport was back, he and Smith continued working on their growing relationship with Powhatan, and a profitable trade relationship actually grew out of that. There was more corn for the settlers now, which is great, but on the economic side of things, The ore refiners and goldsmiths brought over were not finding gold or copper, which is not great news for Newport, because he had promised the higher-ups back home that he would find some and make Jamestown profitable for England. You know, worth the effort, time, and expense, especially since being in North America threatened more conflict with Spain. The Jamestown settlers were so focused on finding gold that they 
kind of neglected their fields and did fewer expeditions upriver. I'm not saying they didn't plant anything, but they didn't plant enough. Supplies were wasted on ventures looking for ore instead of setting up the settlement, and it didn't help that a fire broke out in early 1608, which destroyed most of the existing buildings in the fort, including a large supply of ammunition. Yikes. In April 1608, around three months after he arrived, Newport returned to England, empty-handed. He didn't come back until September. So in the interim period, Smith continued his expeditions throughout Virginia's river systems, making some pretty awesome maps of Virginia while he was at it. Very accurate, very informative. You can look them up online today. They're pretty cool. He had the same basic ideas as before about how he wanted to treat the people he encountered. See, he assumed that English military technology, which arguably was stronger than what they had, would be enough to take the land by force, take the food by force, so he didn't really care so much about trading. He would even employ torture in some cases to get information out of the indigenous he countered. Through this, for example, he was able to find out that two groups, the Paspahe and the Chickahominy, were planning a surprise attack on Jamestown while the settlers were out planting corn, so out in the open and not hiding behind their palisades. Many disagreed with Smith's tactics, But Smith argued that since Pocahontas kept showing up weekly to deliver supplies, and Powhatan must not be too mad about it, right? Now, upon his return to Jamestown, he found that the leader, Ratcliffe, had expended too many materials and supplies, building himself a fancy private house. Because, you know, that's the most important thing in this new settlement, which is struggling. And considering how poorly everyone was doing, it was as bad a move as it sounded. Disease was still rampant, people were starving to death, and here's the leader building himself this fancy new palace in the woods outside the fort. Come on, man. Not cool. John Smith, ever the adventurer, decided he didn't want to be around that nonsense, so he set out again to find what was rumored to be a great salt lake. No, not the one in Utah. It was fabled to be up north somewhere, this big salty lake. He was also hoping that maybe it would be the entrance to the Northwest Passage, the river system that would connect to the Pacific Ocean. Remember that these are the pretty early days of discovery, so they didn't have a clear idea of what the West looked like or how much North American land separated the Atlantic and the Pacific. So Smith explored enough to find out that the Great Salt Lake was actually in French settlements. So now we know the French are here settling too. And we can probably guess that they were talking about one of the Great Lakes, right? The the lakes that separate Canada from the United States. Now, when Smith returned to Jamestown, he found it in even worse condition than when he left. So he had had enough of Ratcliffe and his fancy little palace. He took over, right? He kind of kicked Ratcliffe out of power and he took over. And he started to try and improve the settlement at least best he could. He fixed up the church. They rebuilt the storehouse, which had burned down in the fire. They engaged in trade with the friendly locals for more corn. They got to work training in case of future attacks. And they even extended the fortifications so that it was slightly more of a five-sided structure. They just kind of added on some walls on the eastern side of it. Not just a triangle anymore, right? So all good stuff. When Newport returned in September, he brought with him even more settlers, which is helpful because a lot of them in Jamestown were dying. This time he brought about 70 with them, including two women, the first two women in the English New World, I should say, in English settlements. One of them was Mrs. Thomas Forrest, wife of a gentleman named Mr. Forrest, and the other was her maid, Anne Burris. But Mrs. Forrest isn't mentioned again in historical records, so she probably died soon after arrival. But Anne Burris got married and had kids in the New World, so that's cool. Now, Newport also brought livestock with him, knowing that food was a problem, but they didn't think that one out very well because livestock didn't last too well in Jamestown. Cows and chickens, mostly cows, pigs, right? They need land to graze on. That land is going to be outside the fortifications, unprotected, so livestock were usually stolen or killed. Newport, this third time around, is here to do two main things. One, to explore the James River to the Appalachian Mountain in search of gold and copper. Two, to enhance diplomacy with Powhatan. To do this, he brought with him a crown and a red cloak. 
red was the royal color of England at the time, to coronate Powhatan as a ruler, but also in a way make him a vassal to King James, who claimed ownership over Virginian lands. See, it's, it's, it's going to get really complicated with land and power and who owns what. So let's just focus on the gross stuff. Now, Newport went to the diplomatic route, right? He's trying to crown Powhatan. He's trying to encourage trade. John Smith went the other way, and he's trying to subjugate by force. So you can imagine lots of friction. The thing is, though, Newport was under orders to make Jamestown profitable. He was given an ultimatum this time from those running the expedition back in England. Either provide 2,000 pounds of goods, and I mean English currency pounds, not the weight, 2,000 pounds of goods or support would be revoked, leaving Jamestown settlers to fend for themselves, which means no more Newport supply runs. This tells us, essentially, that they no longer cared for Jamestown as a settlement or even a potential colonization enterprise at the time it was to be considered a trading post. Now, Newport did what he set out to do, both in coronating Powhatan and exploring the James River. He thought he found some silver, so he brought it back in a barrel to test properly, and as you can guess, it wasn't actually silver. But he headed back to England in December 1608, and not with the 2,000 pounds of goods expected of him. Newport just hoped that maybe he brought enough to prove that there was, there was still some potential in North American land. It's now 1609, and the settlement is only getting more dire. The English were having a hard time trading for corn, even from the indigenous groups they were on good terms with. 1608, you see, was a huge drought year, the worst in 700 years in North America, according to some tree ring analysis. So even if the indigenous normally had no problem trading corn, they didn't have any spare to give to the Jamestown settlers. So going into 1609, things were even tougher. Relations with Powhatan was also getting worse over time, as John Smith's way of doing things was upsetting the newly crowned leader of the area. A war between the English and the Powhatan England, uh, the, sorry, the Powhatan Indians, dubbed the First Anglo-Powhatan War, broke out in 1609 and carried until 1614. Now, despite the fact that Newport had not brought back riches, he did still manage to convince King James of Jamestown's importance, or at least the general potential of North American lands. So King James issues a second charter in stating a new governor to rule over Virginian lands. Before they had like a council of sorts, but now a governor is going to be sent over to control things. Maybe that would make it a little better. A renewed interest back home in England broke out, and around 500 to 600 settlers signed up to cross the Atlantic in nine different ships, more or less understanding that things over there were not great, so more power to them. Awesome, right? Hopefully, there's still a settlement for them to come back to. This is now the third supply to come to Jamestown after the initial one, so the fourth group of people, if you will. But a hurricane hits the fleet on its way over. One ship is lost and another is damaged, forcing them to make it for Bermuda in the middle of the Atlantic. And this ship, the one that goes to Bermuda, unfortunately, is the one that had the governor on board, Sir Thomas Gates. Those that did arrive in Jamestown in August 1609, well, I like how Woolley puts it, quote, Having endured a two-month crossing, hundreds of battered, weak, and hungry men, women, unruly youths, children, and livestock might have been hoping to find themselves requited in the bosom of a promised land. Instead, they found themselves descending into an inferno of starvation and sedition. End quote. Things in Jamestown were bad but they'll get worse. John Smith had been in control for the last eight months since Newport left at the end of 1608, and Jamestown was riddled with famine, disease, and increasingly strained relations with Powhatan. And then, in a horrible accident, John Smith manages to burn himself pretty badly when his ammo pouch magically caught fire while he was sleeping. It might have been done on purpose from some Jamestown settlers who didn't like him, but we don't know for sure. What we do know is that the explosion tore the skin from his body and thighs around the pouch, since the ammo pouch was kind of like around his waist, 
And it also um, tore the skin off his uh, manly parts. Sorry to all the men listening to this. John Smith, injured, steps down as a leader, and this gentleman named George Percy, and I'm using gentleman as like a social class thing, named George Percy, one of the original settlers, in fact, became the new president of the settlement. But this is all interim stuff anyway, because the second charter established a new governor for the region. He just hadn't arrived yet. Some ships headed back to England in October 1609, John Smith, who was badly injured and needed proper medical help, went with them. So John Smith is now removed from the equation, okay? And things only continue to get worse. A month later, November 1609, Powhatan attacks Jamestown Fort, trapping around 300 people inside with limited provisions. Their options, fight, negotiate, or wait it out. Fighting is not likely to happen, as they are vastly outnumbered by Powhatan and his warriors, so they just have to try and survive within the walls of Jamestown. Month later, sometime in December, Ratcliffe goes out to Powhatan to try and trade for some corn. He had actually left Jamestown a few months prior to establish a new fort, Fort Algernon in the east, closer to the mouth of the James River. But anyway, Ratcliffe is trying to get some corn off of Powhatan, their one-time friend and now enemy, Long story short and simplified, Powhatan plays the tricks on them, ambushes them in the woods, and captures Ratcliffe. And Ratcliffe's execution is as bad as George Casson's. Ratcliffe was tied to a tree, and then his skin was removed. He was flayed with sharp muscle shells. And then, after he was flayed, they cut his limbs off one by one and threw them in the fire. So, similarly, right? Then they removed his organs, and then they cut off his face. And then, when Ratcliffe died, because he was alive for most of that, what little remained of him was tossed onto the fire. What a way to go. It's now the winter of 1609 going into 1610, and it would be arguably the hardest period in Jamestown's history, because you know everything I've described up to this point wasn't bad enough, right? Back in England, investor confidence in the Jamestown experiment was at an all-time low, though they are encouraged by the potential for growing a recently repopularized crop there, tobacco. And we know that tobacco ends up taking off in a big way, making a lot of money. It helped fuel the entire Atlantic slave trade, that and sugar in the Caribbean, right? So more ships were sent out to Jamestown, but they wouldn't arrive until halfway through 1610. And there wouldn't be much of Jamestown left by then. Remember that ship with the new governor that got lost in Bermuda? Well, they managed to actually fix their ship and set sail again, and they arrived in Jamestown May 1610. New Governor Gates is late, but that's fine. He's here now. He's ready to assert his power as their new leader. But when they arrive, they find a virtually abandoned Jamestown. Remember that Powhatan sieged Jamestown, right? He forced the colonists to stay locked up inside. Well things bottomed out here. Those stuck inside found themselves running out of food, so they turned to the horses. And when the horses were all gone, it was the pigs, then the chickens, then the dogs, and then cats, rats, mice, snakes, mushroom and other fungi growing from the swamps, the leather from their shoes, the, and I'm quoting here from sources who were there, the flesh and excrements of man. And once all of that was gone, I mean, I guess flesh is bad enough, the famine turned people beyond starvation into madness, and it was time for full-on survival cannibalism. First, they dug up the corpse of a recently deceased indigenous man who was living with them at Jamestown. There were a handful who were friendly and living there and helping them get set up, right? They boiled him up and they ate him. Others would drink the blood from the sick and the dying, you know, the ones who are powerless and they can't stop you from drinking their blood, like weird old vampires. And all of this information comes directly from George Percy, by the way, the man running Jamestown at this point. One man, Henry Collins, killed his pregnant wife. 
he ripped the fetus from her womb and threw the fetus into the river. Then he cut up her limbs, salted them for preservation, and hid his wife's salted meat parts around the house. She was reported missing by some who knew her, so George Percy, the one who's in charge, investigated the house, and Percy found all the body parts, and Collins was burned to death for his crimes. I wonder if anybody thought about eating him. At least he was cooked. No word on whether Collins actually ate some of his wife before dying, but you know what? It gives a new meaning to the phrase salt wife. Now, historians and archaeologists have also found evidence of a 14-year-old girl who was the victim of cannibalism. They can tell from the cut marks left in her bones that they chopped her up and they ate her. Was she already dead? Was she killed for food? That's all unknown. We don't know. But her remains make it clear that she was eaten by other Jamestown settlers. And she was found in a pit with a bunch of other animals, too. So the things that were eaten during this period of time. And the winter of 1609 to 1610 was known as the starving time. Historians estimate that around 270 people at Jamestown died during this period. When Gates arrived, he instituted martial law and tried to make things work as the new governor, but after a month, he realized that it was just a failed venture. Jamestown was gone. There was no coming back from years of starvation, famine, skirmishes with the locals that had now turned into a proper war. So they all got on board Gates's ship and they set sail for England June 1610. They were ready to let Jamestown die, along with the promise of English settlement in North America. But then, in another example of just the best timing, the ships from England arrived as Gates and the Jamestown survivors were about to enter the Chesapeake. A newly minted Lord Governor of Virginia, Thomas West, also known as the Lord Delaware, arrived. He gave Gates orders to return to Jamestown, and luckily for those who had just endured the starving time, Delaware brought with him 300 more men, food, well, I should say people, because women were coming at this point too, food and lots of provisions. And at this point, things actually started turning around for Jamestown. It's like the starving time was their rock bottom, and it could only go up from there. Delaware whips Jamestown and his people back into shape. He also knew that things needed to change with Powhatan, and playing nice clearly didn't work, so Delaware got rough. He authorized raids on local Indian towns, killing a bunch of people, stealing their food. He basically wanted to provoke Powhatan into combat so he could get a good sense of his forces and strength. Delaware sent terms to Powhatan to return any English captives and stop raiding, which Powhatan unfortunately refused. So Delaware captured some of his men, cut off their hands, and sent them back. I, I don't know if it was the hands or the people. It wasn't clear. Maybe both? With an ultimatum. If all English men and weapons were not returned, the other Indian captives they had would die, and his soldiers would raid more Indian towns. Unfortunately, this did not stop Powhatan from attacking Jamestown. But despite this, things are actually looking up for Jamestown. Finally, a new governor arrives May 1611 with 300 more people, weapons, food, provisions. Another 280-odd settlers and provisions arrive in that August. In September, a new settlement is established called Enrico, near the James River Falls, so upriver a little bit, which is today's Richmond, Virginia, and it was much less swampy and dangerous, and grew to be a pretty decent settlement, and then town, and then city over time. And, from the times Gates arrived back in May 1610, kind of like the end of the starving time, a man came with him named John Rolfe, who had been experimenting with tobacco crops, and they were taking off in a big way. His initial experiments weren't great. The taste was bitter and the English didn't like it. But after tweaking with it a bit, he improved it enough to where it rivaled South American tobacco and it would soon become the major cash crop in Virginia and the Southern colonies. But there was still Powhatan to deal with. If Jamestown and now Enrico upriver were going to survive, the war with the Native Americans had to be settled. In April, 1613, Pocahontas was captured and well, kidnapped and held for ransom. The English wanted corn, weapons, and any captured English prisoners in exchange for her safety and return. Powhatan 
didn't actually respond for a couple of months. But when he did, he didn't offer enough, and the English kept Pocahontas as a prisoner. So she was taken from Jamestown to Enrico, a safer town, where she would be educated, and she was taught to read and write. And in an attempt to start working on one of the goals from the initial expedition in 1607, they started converting the Native Americans to Protestantism. Pocahontas studied the King James Bible and eventually grew to love the English and this new life. And not just the settlement, but one man in particular. She fell in love with John Rolfe, the tobacco guy. They ended up getting married and having children and Pocahontas converted. Her baptized name was Rebecca. So do with that information what you will. <laughs> But the bigger implications of this was that Powhatan was softening. He was no longer the feared man who ruled over his land with an iron fist. He ended up agreeing to the marriage, and with their union, the first Anglo-Powhatan War ended in 1614. He was no longer strong enough, basically, at this point to stop the English from encroaching on his lands. So English settlements spread. They started popping up along the James River, nice ones, with brick churches, fortified farmhouses, fences to protect against intruders, and not just quickly erected settlements, but proper towns now too. Plots of land were given out to men from earlier expeditions and others in England who wanted to better themselves. Tobacco plantations grew and were successful, as we know, and it was proof that now, Finally, hard-working English men, fed up with their way of life in England, could better themselves in North America by moving there, working their own plots of lands. It was one of the original plans, right, for the Jamestown settlers. And now, seven years later, it was finally coming to fruition. At the expense of the indigenous and the lands that have been theirs for the whole rest of history. But let's not forget all of the hardships, the crises and the cannibalism that founded our country. Thanks for joining me for this episode of A Popular History of Unpopular Things. My name is Kelly Beard, and I hope you've enjoyed the story of the Jamestown Colony. Thank you for supporting my podcast, and if you haven't already checked out my other episodes, go have a listen. You can also support me and the show on Patreon. Just look up A Popular History of Unpopular Things, or AF Out, and join as a cannibal, an explorer, or a historian cannibals and explorers get access to exclusive videos as well so if you're interested in more content or you just want to be a lovely person and support me then check out my patreon and also go subscribe on youtube be sure to follow my podcast available wherever you listen so you know when new episodes are dropped and stay tuned to get a popular history of unpopular things uh -huh.